This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Uh, welcome, all of you, uh, to this our second um, seminar in the uh, Gender and History of the Americas uh, series. Um, I'm Sinead McEnany. I haven't met any of you really at all, so I should just tell you who I am. But anyway, um, and I'm one of the conveners of this seminar. Um, and our speaker uh, this, after this evening this evening is uh, Naomi Pullen from the University of Warwick. Um, and uh, Naomi is going to talk to us about uh, the travels and trials of Mary Weston, um, which you already know. Um, so Naomi is uh, currently a teaching fellow in the University of Warwick, but she splits her time between uh, Warwick and Oxford, and she's involved in all kinds of interesting groups uh, to do with gender and history in Oxford. Uh, would you like me to read them all out? <laughs> you uh, can if you can. want. <laughs> uh, so, um, I mean, there, 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 there seems to be a great network of, um, uh, of uh, Folks up in in Oxford doing all kinds of interesting things. So you are natural. You you are. Sorry, I've lost it now. Uh, oh, I have done the right thing. I forgot it's gone now. Um, do you want to tell us what they are? <laughs> yeah, we can. Go first. Um, so I'm the co- or I'm the coordinator of two programs at Oxford. One's um, called the Centre for Gender Identity and Subjectivity. Um, and the other one is uh, called Women in the Humanities, um, which is part of uh, TORCH, the Oxford Research Centre for the Humanities. <laughs> um, so, uh, and apart from that, uh, then Naomi also teaches uh, early modern history at uh, the University of Warwick, um, where she comes to us from mm. today. Um, so, um, I think that's that's as as much uh, as I'll say at the moment and uh, so the, the plan is that Naomi will talk to us for around about 40 minutes or so there yeah. thereabouts yeah. and then uh, we'll open the uh, discussion to uh, any questions or comments on the paper. Um, so uh, most of the seminars that we have uh, encourage the, the kind of the, this kind of discussion at the very end so it may well be that we have about 40 minutes or so for discussion, or up to around about that for discussion afterwards, okay? Um, I should also say that uh, we will take Naomi for dinner afterwards, and uh, if anybody wants to come with us is more than welcome, okay? And please could you sign the register? And the that's <laughs> one other thing that I need to tell you, is to sign the register. Okay, thank you very much uh, for coming, and uh, Naomi, go on. Okay. Um, well, I guess I'll start by thanking Rachel uh, or Ray for um, inviting me to come in and talk today, and, and thank you for... Uh, coming to hear my paper as well Um, and I think really what I'm going to present to you today is trying to give you a broad overview really of what my research is trying to achieve at the the moment. Um, I'm currently um, trying to adapt my thesis into into a book um, and uh, really what I want to to focus on is how female members of of Quakerism uh, are able to participate within and, and support the movement through their everyday lives, which is one of the objectives of my research. So I'll be really grateful for any feedback um, that you can offer. Um, so I'll start. Um, I'll start with uh, an example. So um, in uh, September 1675. Uh, Quaker women meeting together at Cumberland in England uh, circulated an epistle to the women's meetings um, in England and the American colonies. The writers tellingly expressed that under the influence of true gospel love um, and a degree of that precious union of spirit which as it abounds in our hearts spreads over sea and land and makes us one the whole family and household of faith. Uh, And I think these powerful metaphors of God's love stretching over sea and land and uniting a distant group of believers without the need for geographical borders invokes this power of spiritual friendship that really uh, characterises the early Quaker movement. It suggests that as members of a shared uh, religious community, they were joined together by love of God and that they were united as one, despite the physical distance separating them. 
and perhaps even more significantly, it is through their positions within the Quaker family um, and their own roles within the household uh, that encapsulates this sense of female fellowship. Their maternal and domestic responsibilities enable them to imagine themselves as sharing in a close spiritual communion with their distant co-religionists on the other side of the world. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that they are part of a whole network of women who are regularly communicating with and corresponding with one another. Um, and there are hundreds of these meetings across the Atlantic who are sharing news about the current state of the society in their areas um, and giving expressions of a spiritually edifying nature which they always express as intimacies among friends. Um, and this has added significance when we think about the majority of these women um, who are subscribing their names to, um, to these letters and epistles um, as being from mainly merchant farming, uh, craft and, and poorer households. So I think what's um, important about this is that they are ordinary women who are actively contributing to um, and participating in an exchange of knowledge and ideas um, and sh helping to shape the international character of the early Quaker community. Um, but uh, the place of women within early Quakerism is not, um, not just um, through their role in women's meetings. Um, and early Quaker leaders utilise the Protestant ideology of the priesthood of all believers uh, to argue that there's a universal God-given inward light uh, which is present in all human beings regardless of sex or race. Um, and this really democratises the ministerial function. Um, so Quakers don't believe in, in a class of paid, educated ministers, which means that men and women from all social backgrounds are able to preach uh, when they feel moved to speak. Um, and this really tends towards egalitarian social um, arrangements that were quite radical for the time. Um, so long, um, long before other Christian denominations provide official roles for women as ministers, Quaker women were establishing themselves as evangel evangelists and preachers, um, and some of them were leaving husbands and children in the care of, uh, um, sorry, yeah, were leaving children in the care of their husbands, uh, and travelling as far as Rome, the West Indies, and the American colonies uh, to spread the faith abroad. Uh, so I just put the example there of um, Mary Fisher, who's a servant uh, from Yorkshire, who preaches before the Great Turk um, in 1658. Um, and it's been suggested that 45% of the first Quaker ministers in the American colonies uh, were, were women uh, between 1656 and 1663. Um, and Rebecca Larson um, has estimated that there were 1,300 to 1,500 active female ministers in Britain and the colonies between 1700 and 1775. And I think really the mere existence of this class of or this group of, of female pre preachers really stands in contrast to traditional patriarchal uh, structuring of um, Anglo-American society, which is almost exclusively dominated by male uh, ministers giving almost total control over religious life. Um, so, so they're an unusual phenomenon. Um, and it was really reading... Um, the spiritual autobiographies and the personal correspondence of these Quaker women preachers um, that first sensitised me to the importance of the multiple identities that they have at their disposal. Um, and their rather unusual public roles, um, I think, undoubtedly alter their lives in substantial ways. Um, and it really impacts upon their positions within the family, within their local communities, um, as well as within the wider transatlantic world of Quakerism. Um, and it's that tension um, that really drew me to this, this project. So that, that tension between their roles as public preachers um, and their more private responsibilities. Uh, and that's something that I intend to kind of interrogate in more detail today. Um, so really I want to, to try and um, reconcile how these multiple identities attached to Quaker women, on the one hand, um, how, how they operate um, as spiritual leaders within their communities and as uh, preachers, um, and in many ways they, they're 
traversing uh, traditional uh, gendered and social expectations. Um, it's nearly um, 20 years now since Natalie uh, Zeman Davis uh, published her Women on the Margins thesis. And I think in this seminal work, she acknowledges how women uh, were particularly adept at managing multiple identities outside of official uh, power structures um, and helped to transform the supposed margins of society into important social and cultural centres. A ministerial vocation is never a permanent office for Quaker women. Um, it's, it's a transient experience, uh, to quote the Quaker historian Phyllis Mack, um, whereby um, those, those Quaker uh, male and, and female preachers um, had to balance their life as itinerant preachers uh, with other aspects of their social and personal existences. Um, and uh, just to clarify where I'm using the word friend, it's with, with a capital F, so uh, synonymous with, with, with Quakers at this time. Um, and I think Quakerism is truly unique in this respect because it offers a formal and unrestricted place for, for its female members within the church. Um, so there's no need for them um, to be, say, isolated um, or cloistered residents um, within, a, within a, a religious community. Um, but they're also asked or um, required to serve God in, in ordinary ways as wholly ordinary people. So they're expected to maintain a godly lifestyle while simultaneously participating within the social and economic life of their communities. Um, so I think it helps to create quite a complex identity. So, so looking at them as, as, as prophets, as elders, as worshippers, as friends, as wives and as mothers, I really seek to understand how these women balance their daily lives with their religious membership. Um, and one of the, the broader aims of my, my research is to give priority to, to the somewhat loaded term, I guess, of ordinary uh, women who use Quaker values and beliefs um, to organise their daily lives uh, and to make their everyday experiences meaningful. Um, and by the term ordinary, I'm referring to both non-elite Quaker women, um, but also what I term non-itinerant Quaker women as well. Um, and those are individuals who never received that formal uh, calling to actually travel and preach. Um, and I think that's and, and what my research is aiming to do is to kind of um, re rehabilitate these, uh, these, these women who are both below the rank of gentry and those women who didn't travel into early Quaker history. Um, and this, uh, the chapters of my book are structured um, around the relationships really that, that w women develop both within and without the Quaker community. So I shift outwards from the Quaker family uh, to the women's meetings, uh, to their friendships within the wider community, so the relationships they form with other members of the society, um, and finally to their relationship with the non-Quaker world. Um, and in my paper today I'll just touch upon some of the key issues relating uh, to this. Um, I'll, um, I'll begin by just talking about the, the English and American settings of Quakerism um, um, in both um, and demonstrate the types of sources and research tools um, I'll be utilising to draw my conclusions, um, in particular focusing on the, the deficit of studies really on, on Quaker women's identities as they cross the Atlantic. Um, and I'll conclude by just having a look at the, um, uh, the experiences, um, the travels and trials that I term it of um, one Quaker woman, Mary Weston, um, in an attempt to consider some of the roles and relationships that I'll be drawing upon within my, uh, my broader work. Um, but first, so I'll just uh, give you a brief outline of the Quaker setting uh, for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, with with this period, um, so as I um, mentioned, the Quakers are, uh, are well. The Quakers are really a product of the uh, the turbulent years of the Civil War period, um, and during this time, the growth of radical religious congregations give women the opportunity to openly participate in religious life. Um, but as I said, the Quakers really take this to the extreme in enabling women to preach and undertake missionary work, regardless of where what where what their social status is or where where they're placed within the household. 
Um, and naturally, such such public behaviour um, on the part of women arouses much fear. Um, and critics critics worry that the rise of movements like the Quakers um, would only lead to a society of confusion. Um, and it's encapsulated quite nicely, I think, in um, the work of Donald Lupton in 1655, uh, when he, he talks about the divisive potential of uh, public female speech. Uh, he said, they like not St. Paul's advice, who would not permit women to speak in public, the author wrote. Um, and they presume so far even to railing and scolding. Uh, scolding. Uh, women are called housewives and they should in modesty keep at home um, and obviously Quaker women are, are, are completely defying uh, these expectations so um, a number of women are suffering dramatically um, during the waves of persecution uh, which uh, kind of reached their peak in, in England um, in, in the 1660s um, with the passage of the Con Conventicle Act in 1662. Um, and also it's experienced on the other side of the Atlantic as well. So um, it's uh, w women uh, like Mary Dyer, um, who's executed on Boston Common um, in 1660. Um, and there's uh, the the story of the unfortunately named uh, woman, uh, Horrid Gardner, mm -hmm. uh, who's, uh, who's a mother of many children, um, and she's uh, theatrically whipped whilst clutching um, her, a nursing infant to her breast. So it's quite a provocative image. Um, but really, things start to change for the Quakers. Uh, in 1681, uh, when William Penn is given royal charter to establish Pennsylvania, uh, which is founded on the principle of religious toleration, um, it becomes known as this holy experiment, which is uh, really to prove a haven for uh, maligned uh, Quakers and other religious groups who are facing persecution uh, in their native lands. And, um, as um, as Quakerism crosses uh, to Pennsylvania, it replicates many of the ways of life, the worship patterns, um, and the meetings to which English Quakers uh, are already very accustomed at this time. Um, and they migrate en masse, really, from, from the 1680s and 1690s. Um, and the other change of fortunes is really in 1689 with the passage of the Toleration Act um, in England, uh, but it also affects uh, the American colonies as well. Um, and it's with, with this moment really in Quaker history that we, we often see, or historians often characterise this turning point, um, seeing it as a, a quietest, the movement entering its quietest phase which becomes increasingly focused on maintaining the spiritual purity um, within the Quaker community rather than going out and proselytising and, and looking for, for wider converts. Um, so a new role is really forged, I think, for the, for the movement's women um, at this time as it enters this quietest phase. Um, they become... The, the shift moves from public missionary work um, to, to really maintaining order through the, the women's meeting system. Um, and then with a strong emphasis on domestic harmony and the rearing of a new generation of members. Um, and the mobile nature of uh, Quakerism combi combined with the mass migration of, of Quaker converts to the American colonies um, really, I felt, made, met, lent itself for a, an Atlantic perspective to be adopted in my research. Um, and as um, Rebecca Larson has uh, suggested, it's the early Quakers identified themselves globally as members of one community linked by shared beliefs instead of geographical boundaries. Um, so it's through um, integrating and comparing evidence of, um, of Quaker women's experiences in England and the American colonies that I feel that I can gain a much more nuanced understanding um, of their, their, um, their place within the Atlantic Quaker community. Um, and it's my belief that despite um, some uh, geographical variation, um, largely in fulfilling their roles within the meeting, within the church and the family, these women really participate within a shared uh, spiritual sphere that defies class and gender um, distinctions and which then serves to unite them across the Atlantic. And I think it was nicely encapsulated in that, that opening example I showed you. Um, 
naturally, of course, there's been numerous um, historical studies about Quaker women um, in the last 20 years, um, which have always tended to focus on the more sensationalist and dramatic aspects of their experiences, um, such as the conflicts that emerge um, within families as a result of uh, a mother's conversion to Quakerism, uh, or her decision to cede um, those respons maternal responsibilities to her husband. Um, and women who are um, prolific travellers, uh, sufferers and writers, they occupy um, an important position within uh, Philip, Phyllis Mack's uh, seminal work, uh, Visionary Women. Um, she argues that Quaker women seem to be denying the reality of all outward cultural restraint, constraints. Um, and in, in this sense, um, she suggests that their, their preaching careers are not necessarily compatible with their maternal and wifely responsibilities, particularly when women are leaving their young families um, in the care of husbands and relatives, uh, or when they're persecuted and imprisoned. Um, and given the rather radical and unconventional quality of these roles, it's not surprising that a lot of Quaker women have been viewed as proto-feminists. Um, their public activities are seen as defiant acts of protest against male power, um, specifically the patriarchal authority of a husband. Um, so there's lots of written accounts of Quaker women who are deliberately defying their husbands um, and joining the movement without their consent. Um, and it's been argued uh, by one Quaker historian, Margaret Hope Bacon, um, in her appropriately titled Mothers of Feminism, um, that uh, the struggles of early Quaker women in America um, are, um, can be equated to this microcosm for the long struggle for gender equality in society at large. Um, so a number of feminist scholars um, have, have praised uh, those public preachers uh, for achieving social identities that are distinct um, from their position within families. Um, but I think it's the second type of uh, Quaker woman I mentioned uh, that's largely re remained absent uh, from the historical picture. Um, and this is the woman who characterises much of the, um, the efforts of the early 18th century Quaker movement, uh, when the focus of the uh, Quaker activity is returned to, to nurturing the faith within the home and within the family. Um, so I think in particular the place of the women's meetings in this picture is particularly important um, and something I'll um, return to later. Um, but essentially the we women's meetings, um, female, um, female elders become uh, regulators of the social and moral welfare of their communities and then again a really vital public presence among within their local communities. Um, uh, yeah, and I think, actually, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, yes, but I think, obviously, it's important to, to not to overlook the centrality, really, of the private world of the household um, as formative influences um, on Quaker women's experiences, which I think are really important sites for shaping their public identities um, as both preachers and as members of their community. Um, and uh, a recognition of this is, is again that role of the non-itinerant women in, in shaping um, the movement and supporting um, travelling ministry. Um, so um, yeah, and we've got a particular problem when we, we come to thinking about the American dimension of early Quakerism. Um, Danielle Daniela Costran and Lisa Vollendorf have recently realised that there's been little sustained effort to question what can be learned about the Atlantic world through the lens of women, gender and religion. And I think this is a crucial issue for, for um, research into American Quakerism, um, who only focus on those <coughs> Quaker members who have made a significant political or economic contribution uh, to colonial society or um, discuss women moving outside of their 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 um, roles within within the, the movement itself um, so I'm I'm therefore trying to to rehabilitate the American side of Quakerism as well um, trying to um, ne not necessarily see um, the equation of public roles and radical speech with active participation. So I, I, in my book I aim to explore this through a comparative framework of um, 
women's roles and identities in England and the colonies. Um, but the, one of the problems, obviously, with we're, we're trying to focus on ordinary women um, or lower status Quaker women is is um, the fact that many of them don't leave behind detailed information about their lives and their experiences. Um, so the question is certainly when I started my research was how how can I access these stories? How can I uncover their their experiences? Um, one of the unusual things about Quakerism is that it does have an unusually strong preservationist focus. Um, so they, they very early on, Quakers were very good at documenting their experiences from the start. Um, so there's an unusually large collection of manuscripts and correspondence in um, available to researchers in places like Friends House in London. Um, but what's also interesting is, as I mentioned, that unlike any other religious dom denomination at this time, they permit women to hold independent um, monthly and quarterly uh, and, year um, and in America yearly meetings as well um, for business. Um, there's, there's regional and geographical variation, but the women's meetings are accountable for overseeing uh, behavior of female members of the movement, uh, granting financial relief um, and material assistance to poor friends, and overseeing complex, um, the complex Quaker marriage discipline procedure. Um, and the extraordinary thing about these meetings is that they parallel the men's in terms of how they're structured and organised. Um, so they have a nominated uh, clerk, treasurer and, over and overseers, um, which means that we have a, a written record of their proceedings um, within their meetings. Um, and I just put up an example there to show you how detailed some of these minutes can actually be. Um, and I think is quite unique for, for the for the time. Um, so it means that where we often other um, sectarian movements of this period, we'd have to rely on the writings of men. Um, what's great about this is that we can get a real insight into women's institutional life of, um, within the society, and it's something that's. Um, it's, it's a resource that's often been overlooked because um, it can be quite formulaic, formulaic um, and there's some often gaps and omissions in, in what, what they've recorded. Um, but I think it gives a really strong insight into the types of activities that women can perform within their communities. And there's also large sets of correspondence and family papers um, written by a broad range of female writers from different social backgrounds. Um, but there's, as uh, as I've sort of hinted at, there's been a tendency to overlook these kind of more per the personal side of Quakerism um, and to generally look at the more sort of dr dramatic published spiritual autobiographies left by itinerant um, Quaker women. Um, so, yeah, and I think... I think so. Really, anyone who, who seeks to understand the role of Quaker women, um, for whom almost there are, for some of whom there's almost no biographical information available. There's a array, an array of, of sources and methodological tools available to them. Um, and I just want to now focus on the life of um, one Quaker woman who I've uncovered in my research, um, who's called Mary Weston, um, and. Um, I want to think about how her tra uh, the tra her travel journal and personal correspondence, which was never published, um, and maybe one of the reasons why she's been largely overlooked, um, shows the different meanings and identities that she's able to bring to her experiences as a travelling missionary. Um, so I'd just give you a brief biography. Sorry about the... I don't know what happened with that slide. <laughs> um, but yes, so Mary Weston is born um, Mary Pace in uh, Southwark in 1717 um, and she's the daughter of a prosperous linen draper. Um, her education is one which favours training um, in business rather than religious instruction um, and she, she records kind of her increasing disillusion um, with her commercially uh, orientated upbringing. Um, so her, she sort of describes in later life how her parents had ne neglected the strict education in various branches of that Christian testimony. Um, and she increasingly strays as a teenager from, from the movement from, from Quakerism 
um, and then undergoes a deep sort of spiritual crisis. Um, and it's after she has the, this crisis that she she spends the rest of her life really striving for the redemption and acceptance within the Quaker Church. Um, and she becomes an approved public minister um, at the age of 22 um, and in June 1735 um, embarks upon one of um, of many uh, religious visits uh, to Quaker meetings across the British Isles. Um, in 1741 she marries Daniel Weston who's a wealthy cooper and merchant um, from Surrey um, with wealthy uh, with extensive connections across the Atlantic. Um, and she, she has a long career as a public minister, but I just wanted to focus on the two years in which she, um, she undertakes extended ministerial work to the American colonies uh, between 1750 and 1752. Um, and it's really clear from reading her personal writings and her, her travel journal that she really struggles to balance um, a, this public presence within the community with her natural urges to remain um, industrious at home and care for her young family. Um, and uh, one of her uh, friends even uh, commented before her departure to America, um, so in, uh, just before um, in July 1750, that the voyage was a great cross to her natural inclinations. Um, and it's during her travels to the colonies that Mary often wrote, um, writes about the impatience she has um, of, uh, of hearing from her husband and daughter. So in, oh, let's done it again. Um, in one letter shortly after her arrival um, in August 1750, she urged her, um, she urged her husband and daughter uh, not to be distant uh, since our moving parting. Uh, but to write by every ship bound to any part of the continent, for I am almost impatient to hear from thee. Um, and she closed the letter with a poignant conclusion, explaining that the, the love she had for her small family, um, who she regards as dearer to me than life itself. Um, but obviously these, these concerns are not enough to uh, prevent her, her leaving and having this broader uh, spiritual calling. Um, and many um, feminist historians would argue that it's that absence from her family in the domestic setting which is a real sign of her liberation. Um, but I think, as this letter shows nicely, it's her concerns for the, the well-being of her family suggest that they're really not um, far from you know, her, her, th her heart, from her thoughts. And I think they really encapsulate the tensions that she experiences as a mother whose natural inclination is to remain at home and care for her family. Um, and there's this real tension, I think, in, her, in both her and other Quaker missionary writings about whom that obedience should, um, should be shown to, who should loyalty be shown to, to God or, or to the family. Um, and I think it's pro particularly problematic for female Quaker preachers um, because familial contact, so the actually thinking, co corresponding with and communicating with their families is a temporal concern. Um, and it really can be seen to be in some ways in conflict with that wider spiritual calling um, that they're trying to achieve. Um, but I think most, um, like most Quaker women, Mary Weston's able to reconcile her decision to travel um, by explaining that her divine calling uh, would ultimately ensure the spiritual welfare of her family. Um, so in one letter to her husband, uh, Daniel, in November 1750, um, she she writes or she explains how she hoped that both her husband and her daughter uh, may still be may still with me be sharers of divine bounty in both health body and the influences of the blessed split spirit um for which as she explained they they were all um participants that they rejoice that rejoice her very soul um so i think her absence from the, the household is radical um, because her husband Daniel um, becomes the primary carer for their six-year-old daughter um, who she leaves behind. Um, but members of the movement, as I've hinted, accept um, women's absence from the family as a crucial aspect of their ministerial obligations. 
Um, and like uh, most husbands who marry uh, Quaker female ministers, um, her husband Daniel is um, expected to provide the, the support that she needs, both financial and emotional, whilst she's travelling abroad. Um, and I think this is a, a, it's revealed very much in the correspondence between Mary and Daniel that this is a relationship very much uh, grounded in mutual affection and support. Um, so in one letter um, from August 1750, um, he explains how it was a very near trial to be so deprived of one of the most affectionate and best of wives and a true helpmeet. Um, but he was nonetheless able to reconcile his wife's absence uh, when he expresses that it was a duty required by her great lord and master um, and that he could do no other than resign her to his work and service. Um, and since ministers are forced to relinquish their domestic responsibilities, um, it's, I think, in the process, it's arguable that uh, that women needed to find substitutes for their absent families whilst they're travelling. Um, so I think this is where the subject of friendship and the connections that they form with, with friends, with other members of the society, become central to their experiences. Um, and what's interesting about um, Mary's travels in particular is that they're very often, um, un um, very often or almost always um, undertaken in, in the company of a female companion. Um, and they, they were described as spiritual yoke mates um, who, um, as the historian Amanda Herbert has argued, developed emotionally and spiritually meaningful relationships with one another in order to mitigate the hardships of travel. Um, and then, like most Quaker ministers, uh, Mary Weston's actually unable to find a suitable companion to travel with at the start of her journey. Um, and as I think, I'm sorry about this, um, <laughs> but as she uh, writes to what, um, her cousin um, Abigail Watson, um, she 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 describes how she's resolved uh, to submit to the will the will of God in the hope that my good master will provide me with one uh, when the time comes. Um, so her, but actually, what's interesting is reading her travel journal. Um, despite the fact that she doesn't initially have a female companion, is that she's never in short supply of female volunteers to accompany her across the American uh, wilderness for for, for two years, um, and she very much attributes this as a providential sign of the divine favour that she's experienced in her ministry. Um, so uh, one, one friend, um, uh, a New York uh, Quaker, um, Mary Brown, decides to accompany her to Newport in July 1750. Um, and she, and Mary, um, Mary explains how she was truly thankful um, that my good ma uh, yeah, she was truly thankful that my good master had been pleased to provide such an excellent helpmeet in the time of trouble and great need. Um, so I, th I think what, what stands out for me, having looked at other types of uh, friendship um, patterns amongst women at this time, um, is that Mary is in some ways expressing a, a kind of lack of agency um, in choosing her own companions. Um, so, and I think that that's one um, one aspect of Quaker conceptions of friendship that really differ markedly from from wider society, um, because there's very much an expectation that individuals are very active in in and carefully selective in who they're choosing as their friends. Um, and I think in the Quaker case, um, and as Mary's experiences show quite nicely, it's the divine sanction uh, which seems to determine whether a relationship is going to be successful. Um, and actually, it's seen as highly providential in how, how women um, friends are brought together. Um, and one of the interesting things about Mary is that she also encounters a very different type of friendship as well. And that's the more official type of friendship, which I kind of describe as friendship with a capital F, um, which um, includes the strong networks of hospitality and support that she encounters while she's traveling across the American colonies. Um, so she's a complete uh, stranger um, when she doesn't know anyone in the American colonies when she starts her travels in 1750. Um, and 
um, as, as these examples show, she's able to pick up companions uh, while she's travelling along the way. Um, and one particularly um, important um, uh, relationship that she forges is with wealthy uh, merchant families uh, like the Pemberton family in Pennsylvania, or in, um, who, who live in Philadelphia. Um, and they become a kind of surrogate family for Mary, uh, what, and her the main source really of uh, fina financial um, and emotional support while she's travelling. And they they sort of become a clearinghouse uh, for correspondence uh, di being directed to Mary. Um, and they they're an interesting family because they really do seem to having having researched them, they seem to have really gained eminence for their their generous hospitality. Um, and the guidance that they offer. Um, and it, it's nicely encapsulated, I think, in a letter that Daniel uh, Weston, so Mary's husband, sends um, to um, Israel uh, Pemberton, um, in which he recognises the uh, repeated acts of the greatest friendship to her, which has made her passage in that land much easier than it would otherwise have been. Um, and I think that experience of travel really alters how Mary Weston views her social world. Um, and they, they, they encourage her to form a lifelong friendship with, with the Pemberton family, so with her former host family, um, which includes um, providing hospitality for members of the family who come travel over to England. Um, but she also arranges the shipment of goods from England to the American colonies um, for, for decades after she's, she's visited um, and stayed with the Pembertons. Um, and I think it becomes a very emotionally um, and spiritually supportive um, relationship that's not, not, but also has an economic dimension to it as well. Um, and th but there is a real, real emotional um, dimension in the relationship that she forms with her companion and landlady, uh, Mary Pemberton. Um, and one letter um, sent uh, shortly home, uh, uh, shortly after her return home in 1752, reveals the enduring nature of their friendship. Um, so she writes that despite the fact that they may, may never behold the faces of one another um, more, um, their friendships grounded in the spiritual unity. Um, so she writes, truth makes the friends of it more dear to each other than the nearest relation, where the cementing virtue is wanting, which, as David saith, passes the love. Um, and uh, it's really reminiscent of this biblical friendship of Jonathan and David, who, who, whose souls are, being, are described as being knit together. Um, and it's a really interesting and repeated trope between the chorus, correspondence between the two Quaker women at this time. Um, and I think in that way, the Quakerism provides an alternative form of friendship um, for these women uh, because they could inhabit this shared uh, spiritual as well as uh, temporal relationship. Um, and Mary's also affected by the encounters that she has with the non uh, Quaker world as well and I think as a public preacher traveling in the American colonies um, with uh, very very little knowledge of the areas that she's going to um, there's a lot of uh, possibilities for for tension um, and especially when we we think about how people like Mary Dyer who he's executed on, on Boston Common uh, are treated in some in some of the the Puritan colonies um, and I think as an itinerant woman travelling from place to place, she probably aroused quite a bit of suspicion. Um, and she, she describes um, in one of her, in her one passage in her journal, how um, her, um, what is, uh, she, she explains her concerns about visiting Connecticut, owing to the fact that she, she says that the, the people were very much strangers to friends and their, their principles. Um, and indeed that some few years ago were bitter enemies against them. Um, and she even notes uh, the aversions um, in her letter. She describes how um, the opposition and hostility she'd experienced um, from some of the local inhabitants had brought her mind uh, very low. Um, and I imagine that in some of the places she's traveling, they've never experienced, like barely even experienced a preacher, let alone a, a female preacher. Um, 
but it's also um, anecdotal evidence also suggests that her presence in some places is is somewhat of a novelty as well, um, and um, she there's not always a Quaker network of support to rely upon. Um, so uh, one is, one interesting um, letter that she talks she talks about um, how great throngs of people had attended one of the meetings that she'd organised. Um, she noted that many hundreds came to hear her preach in December 1750, um, to the extent that not everyone could fit into the building. Um, and there was another meeting, uh, and I think she was exaggerating, but she said that there were four, um, between four and five thousand people um, <laughs> at one of the meetings in Newport, and I think that's more than the population mm. of Newport <laughs> at that time. Um, but I think it, it suggests a sense of of, um, of novelty, and um, there, there's another Irish preacher who's travelling in the American colonies called Mary Peasley, who who describes a very similar experience in in, in New England as well. Um, she 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 speaks about how it's almost impossible to fit them into the the town hall, and um, how it's also very challenging to talk, actually try and speak to them um, through through her own divine in, inspiration as well. Um, yeah, and then after um, after Mary returns home, her her life is um, very much determined by the presence that she has within her local uh, Quaker women's meeting, um, and I think it's an important part of her identity. Um, unfortunately, there's few letters surviving, or few um, few minutes surviving for the London's meeting, so we can't know exactly what role um, Mary would have had within. Um, within her local community um, but uh, we know that these meetings play a vital role within um, within the developing uh, society um, because Quakers don't have a full-time clergy so very much the business um, falls upon women um, and I think and the creation of these meetings is very much grounded upon um, that recognition of their special duties as as um, the protectors of female virtue um, and what makes them unique is that they're almost completely autonomous um, from from the men's meetings um, and uh, I'll just see there's an example here so this is um, a meeting house of a uh, Falls Quaker meeting in Pennsylvania and it's actually embedded in the architecture of the um, the meeting that women um, and men would separate so those um, those are sort of sliding shutters that come down so they have their meeting for worship together and then they separate off the men's and women's meetings which I think quite nicely shows how they're kind of considered as equals but also sort of separate as well um, and one of the, the in important things is that the couples who wanted to marry um, had to first come to the women's meeting for permission to marry um, before going uh, to the men's meeting. So in some ways, um, and there's a lot of tension around this, that they could in theory have the first um, veto over whether a match could take place, which I, th I think gives them an unusual level of power. Um, but it sort of becomes a vital outlet, I think, for women's everyday lives. Um, so it helps to shape the, the social and cultural outlook of the society. Um, and I think having like-minded women like meeting together on a regular basis um, offers um, important um, and new outlets for female sociability to occur at this time. So stressing the, the, this idea of female society and friendship um, and very much this emphasis on group uh, fellowship over kind of the, the individual. Um, and I think this becomes uh, crucial for both those women who don't travel as well as uh, for preachers like um, Mary Weston um, and their status becomes very much um, involved within their knowledge of the local communities um, and uh, the, the first uh, opening example I gave you was part of a collection of 80 um, epistles which were sent to and um, to and by women's the me women's meeting in London, um, and that the, all these letters are basically a transatlantic collection. So we've got letters from the West Indies, from Barbados, um, from different American colonies, um, and I think 
uh, as well as from Ireland and, and Scotland. So these women become part of this truly um, international network, and I think that's imp- particularly important for, for women like Mary Weston, who come from, from the London Quaker community, which becomes a very much a hub of, um, of, of, this, um, of this correspondence. Um, so yeah, so um, I just briefly conclude. So some of the conclusions that I'm drawing. Um, well, I think obviously we can hopefully my discussion has shown the multifaceted nature of Quaker women's identities. Um, so not only are they t- undertaking ministerial uh, work that's unparalleled, um, but um, for other movements at this time, but they're conducting it in same-sex female pairings, um, leaving children um, um, in the care of husbands and relatives, um, but also it's achieved through making contact along the way with both um, Quaker and non-Quaker um, acquaintances, which undoubtedly I think goes on to, sh- to shape new attitudes and concerns. Um, the spheres of uh, religion and everyday life are coextensive, in my opinion, um, and Quaker individ- ideals within both the household and the structure of the movement are mutually reinforcing. Um, so I wouldn't say that Mary Weston's experiences are necessarily representative of, of Quaker women's experiences in the movement more generally, um, but I think her story provides a really useful um, window or insight into how we can understand the different relationships and concerns attached to her public identity. Um, and on a final note, I think it's just worth emphasising um, that uh, this is occurring at the very margins of early modern society, to come back to Natalie Zeman Davis's idea, um, within a movement that's forced to separate itself from a world um, that that's surrounding it um, and very much Quaker women are identifying themselves by what they're not um, in a lot of ways. Um, so I'm hoping uh, that what my book will finally achieve is to break down um, these fixed geographical um, spaces and to place really the experiences and the relationships uh, common to most women, so the family, um, the meetings, the, the friendships, um, at the heart of of the discussion and I hope then that I can kind of reconsider how um, how we understand the intersection of gender and religion across the 17th and 18th century Atlantic. So thank you.